stream. Uh, let us know where you guys are joining from today and if my audio is coming in good. Um, leave a one in the chat if the audio sounds good. Um, it's going to be me today, so uh, all your guys' support and engagement is going to be very much welcomed uh, to encourage me. I got a lesson actually planned. We're going to be doing something a little bit different. Um, we got a, a vibe board lesson planned. I want to talk about how manufacturers can create products that get better after you buy them. Um, it's something we talk about all the time, but how do you actually do that? Right. Let's do, let's do a model architecture. Let's talk about what are the hardware you're going to need? What's the architecture you're going to need? What's the data historian you need? Uh, real quick sponsored by Canary. Canary is like, um, it kicks Pi's ass basically. <laughs> they, they came into the market and they're like, what is Pi doing wrong? And then let's do it better. So thanks Canary for sponsoring this live stream. Hey Josh, hey Dwayne. All right, um, is that a little bit better? I turned it down a little bit. Let me see. Hello, hello, okay. Yeah, so I got, um, I'm on this mic right here, so. Because if I'm doing, if I'm, you know, doing a, a presentation over here, uh, this this mic won't necessarily be able to pick it up. So, hey Ben, hey Sayaf, hey Cheryl, hey Matthew, hey, what do you guys think of Tesla? By the way, Tesla stock up nine percent yesterday. They announced a hundred thousand car order, a hundred thousand Model S's. Um, order came in from Hertz. Um, plays right into this conversation right here. Products that get better after you buy them. Uh, Tesla is like one of the prime examples. Um, our shout out, quick shout out to Arduino who sent me this little guy, this Arduino Nikola sends me. I think this is gonna be, you know, this is from the Arduino Pro line. This is gonna be something, um, it's definitely gonna be used for prototyping, whether or not you use this in production on products that you ship out the door to report sensor data back. Um, I think it's still, we're going to need to actually, you know, field test this thing and get some of you guys, uh, get this in the hands of some of you guys to, uh, to actually play with and test. Right. So, but you know, Tesla, every model S that they ship, every model three, every, every vehicle they ship since like 2017, I believe came with a full self-driving hardware package, whether or not the customer purchased full self-driving. Um, in fact, right there on the touchscreen, you can actually they can self-select to upgrade to full self-driving um, because they have the hardware. So most, most manufacturers would want to cut cost. They would be looking short term. Hey, if they didn't pay for this hardware, why the hell would I ship it to them? That's because the value, the data, the data is much more valuable, right? Tesla is becoming an AI company. They're becoming in the next Fang, right? Fang, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google, Hey, Dan, no, you're right on time. Sorry, I, I, I got to remember to breathe when I do these things. All right, everybody take a nice big breath in with me. In through the nose, out through the mouth. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. I don't know why I, I do this all the time, but I don't know. I feel like sometimes maybe you guys subscribe for Walker, but you know, I still do have valuable things to say, so I appreciate you guys being here. Oh, shit. All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take the headphones off. Oh, we had a great comment that came in actually on our other second channel. Um, can you see? I don't know if you guys can see this here. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and remove the chat overlay, make that a little bigger. Um, yeah. Someone from the i4.0 community, Richard Anderson, said, Walker, this format is great, and I believe you should keep it as is. If this works for you, then it'll work for everyone else, too. I have enjoyed this maybe even a little more than the iPhone, iPhone 4.0 work. Hey, be, watch out there. I mean, I guess that's a compliment, but also it means we probably need to step our game up here too. Uh, we're always trying to improve the content and your guys' feedback is super valuable in that. Let's do the Tony Robbins primer. <laughs> Everybody like raise your hands. <laughs> Sorry, I haven't seen too many Tony Robbins uh, uh, seminars, but uh, let's see. I have enjoyed this uh, even a little better than the i4.0 work. That's awesome. Um, I'm not sure yet. So to keep it up, and he said, I'll be adding to the conversation in the comments in the future and maybe even being able to challenge your thinking. That's awesome. That's the whole point. This is an open dialogue. This isn't a soapbox. This is a discussion. This is the community. 
Um, and speaking of the community, make sure to join the Industry 4.0 Community Discord server. I'll put a link on the screen right now. Uh, you guys have an amazing, amazing, there's, there's an amazing community there and we couldn't do it without everyone joining. I mean, every day we have 10 plus people joining. We're about to cross 3000 members. So uh, to see the discussion in there is really awesome. So let me go ahead and um, move over to uh, the actual presentation today. All right, so I actually did this drawing the other day. Um, there was a, there's a little bit of uh, confusion about you know digital twin versus UNS. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, clear it up right now. So the digital twin, let me make sure that I can see the comments in case something happens with the audio, because um, I won't be able to know. All right, chat. Let me, oh, let me remove that off the screen so you guys can see me. Chat, okay. Hey, Dan. Hey, Justin. Thanks, Justin. All right. So UNS, right? Uh, unified namespace, right? It is the single source of truth for all data and information. All events pass through the unified namespace. It's your entire business. And the biggest distinction is that it's your current state and all events. Someone said the other day, well, all events aren't passing through the unified namespace until you connect everything to the unified namespace. And we all know uh, digital transformation is an iterative process. Oh, shit. Let's see. Right there's a little iteration. It's a circular process. It's an iterative process. Um, it's, not a, it's not a project, but it is a strategy. Right? Is that coming through good? Let me know if the experience is nice on that. Um, so in theory, you actually never fully get to the unified namespace, right? You, it's, it's something you're always working towards every time you add a new piece of equipment on. Um, I mean, there's really two, there's a two-pronged approach. What are you gonna do for the old? And what are you gonna do for the new? Old, you're typically putting in a gateway. Uh, in this case, let's use the IO hub. Hey, I'm going to standardize on using the IO hub and its communication drivers as my edge gateway. And there's the gateway box. For new, minimum technical requirements. What are the minimum technical requirements? Uh, report by exception, edge driven, lightweight, open architecture. So you develop a two pronged approach for what, what is my strategy for integrating the old legacy technology? What is my strategy for integrating the new technology? Now, there might be a, kind of a third scenario, which really falls under the second scenario, which is, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm evaluating this new piece of software. It's going to be new, but it doesn't quite yet support MQTT with Spark Plug B, right? Well, part of your job is to require that it does, or it supports your minimum technical requirements. You need to compel your vendors to change. Manufacturers, we have a lot of buying power, right? This community, we have a lot of influence. There was uh, someone posted on LinkedIn the other day that said, hey, uh, all these vendors are reaching out to me and they're, they're wanting to know why I'm not using IIoT uh, and MQTT yet. They're, that's all they're talking about. This community is driving that, right? The Spark Plug B working group is driving that. Arlen Nipper, right? Walker Reynolds, 4.0 Solutions, the mastermind, the mentorship community. We have a lot of influence together. So we need to use that to help change manufacturers, right? To leverage a unified namespace using a uh, edge driven, right? These edge devices or like, you know, here's an IO hub publishing into our namespace. You know, here's a PLC publishing into our namespace, subscribing into the namespace, getting data back down, right? So the unified namespace is really just a concept that we teach but it's what we live by, right? It's the digital strategy, right? Digital twin software is not current state. Uh, digital twin software is a snapshot. Now, you might have seen the current state visible within a digital twin software. So what I like to do is I, I call that the live view. Now, your live view is gonna be powered from the unified namespace. Now, some of you might say, hey, Zach, my Digital Twin software has a unified namespace. Well, then, you know, then it's really just a platform in here. 
it's, it's still, we, we like to separate it because people that use digital twin typically don't know what they're talking about. They're using it more as a buzzword. Um, unified namespace is a, is a foundational architecture stra stra uh, strategy that we teach, right? You, you're actually going to start seeing more blog articles, people referencing the unified namespace. Those are referencing our content or they're, they're either referencing our content and giving credit where it's due, or they're just hijacking it for their own. So watch out for that latter group. But um, so there's no reason why a digital twin software can't have unified namespace built in, which in, in this case, you know, it's a little, in, it's a little sub instance of the UNS that, you know, gets populated. So essentially, remember unified namespace is everywhere. It it's, has everything and it's everywhere. So, um, you know, unified namespace is, it's actually on your IO hub, right? It's, it's, it's in your Amazon cloud. There's a unified namespace up here. This is the architecture that we're building. We're gonna get into how, the, how we can leverage this to make products that get better after we buy them. So, but first I wanna talk about this. Uh, you guys can see that here. Oh, I gotta change the screen over here. So this vibe board is pretty cool because I'm drawing it up here, but I'm also, I'm sharing my screen from, uh, from the web interface. So this is really important. Um, there's a lot of people, I don't know why, but there's a lot of people that say digital transformation is continuous improvement. They're full of shit. They're lying to you. Okay. They're trying to sell you a product. There's a couple names that come to mind. Uh, digital transformation is groundbreaking innovation. It's this, it's the lighthouse project. Um, if you're familiar with Kaizen, Kaizen is, uh, or Six Sigma, Black Belt, right? There's continuous improvement. There's a lot of different words for it, but essentially it's incremental, small incremental change, perfecting a process, right? At first, when we're right here, there's, uh, there's very little reward, very little reward. Finally, the, it starts paying off and there's a lot of, lot of big improvements here, followed by, this is the technology S curve, right? This was industry 3.0. This is legacy auto, right? This is your Fords, GM, right, et cetera, Toyota, et cetera, right? This is your Teslas. Tesla, we'll give Rivian a shout out. Uh, maybe uh, even, you know, I haven't looked at too much at, uh, but there's also like a couple others, Lucid. Um, there's also another one called Nikola, but that's not an actual real company. So just scratch Nikola off. But um, essentially, this is this is it's a new technology S curve altogether. It's a brown. It's Kaizen was old game played better. Then there's Kaikaku, which is breakthrough innovation. Right, we're taking the old game and we're making new rules. And then there's Kaishuen, which is essentially it's the new technology S curve. This is I four so when you see someone say digital transformation is continuous improvement, you can see exactly why it's not very clearly. Are there any questions? Let me, let me take a break here. Are there any questions? Uh, thank you, Justin. Hey, Devin, good morning. Good morning, uh, Benjamin looks great. Audio still coming through good. Mark Ritchie, flat MQTT needs to be migrated into Spark plug B. Could you clarify? Uh, I will. I will get to that. Actually, let me just do it right now. So we go to four, page four. This is a common question that comes up, and this is one of the advantages of Spark Plug, or this is one of the advantages of MQTT. Um, why do I keep doing G? Oh wait, do eraser. Try this, do a little. See if that works. Close enough. <laughs> All right, uh, let me let me swat this back. There we go. Okay.
There we go. So, um, so let's draw out the namespace. So we have enterprise. Oh, let me turn that off. All right. So this is our you know, our core namespace. This is the root node, and then we have leaf nodes, enterprise. You know, um, then we have like site or plant, right? Enterprise plant. Plant A, you know, then we have plant B. We have like, you know, um, then we have like area A. Then line one. Plant B has, you know, area B, line one, line. So, and forgive me if this is too hard to read. I'm just trying to. Lay it out here. So here's these levels. So this is enterprise site area line, and then below your line you even have cell. But for this, let's just go down to the line level. This is your spark plug namespace. Okay. But you know, within within your broker down here, you could have unstructured namespace, and it could be above. It doesn't really matter. But so you have unstructured. So you could just have like um, let's say line two has a PLC, you want to publish it, but it doesn't support spark plug, right? It just supports MQTT. What you're going to do is you're going to publish it down to the unstructured or vanilla. We'll call it vanilla MQT unstructured. Okay. And it's going to be like, essentially it might be, um, something like this. Say it's an Opto 22 PLC, and then right under it, it has all your tags. Now this is, you, you'd probably want to use the MQTT Spark Plug B functionality on the Opto, but just for the purposes of this demonstration, let's just say you wanted to have it unstructured. You have all your tags just in a flat structure, you know? thousand tags or whatever. What you're going to do is you're going to, this is your namespace, right? So we'll put a big circle around it so you can kind of visualize it. Is that looking good? What you'll do in order to get it into this namespace right here, you'll have a client, we'll call it a microservice. This might be a Python script. This might be, it might be a data transformation tool like uh, Hibyte, right? Could be any number of those things. But what it's going to do is it's going to subscribe to this area in the namespace. It's going to run some code, right? And we'll just do this. So it's going to do some post-processing. And then it's going to publish back into this portion of the namespace. Does that make sense? You can have multiple root nodes, exactly, right? So in this case, the secondary root node would be like your unstructured namespace. Or you'd have, a, you know, this is not structured, this is structured. This follows, uh, you know, ISA 95. Um, so it's like group, uh, node ID, group ID, right? Um, device ID. So using these tools, you can basically map your Spark Plug B devices into a structured namespace that um, that you can make sense of, right? Someone said, actually, as Rick Pilata said, the, the world is not hierarchical, but if it, uh, but it actually is. Everything kind of boils down to a hierarchy. Now, it might fall into multiple hierarchies, right? I fall into the hierarchy of my family. I fall into the hierarchy of 4.0 solutions. And I also fall into the hierarchy of the United States. United States, Utah, Salt Lake City, the Morton apartment um, in downtown, which famously has a BMW that you can rent. Um, Zach Scriven, right? That's my location. I'm not going to tell you my unit number. If you guys want to send me some mail, send me a DM on Discord. I'm happy to do unboxings. I love, love product, love swag. But <laughs> um, anyways... So this is a microservice, um, even platforms like uh, um, Libre, 
That's what they're high, that's what they're high on. Libre is talking all about microservices and, and building their S95 model into a GraphQL interface um, and, and creating the ability to create these microservices. But essentially, that's all it's doing. It's taking this piece of data, transforming it, and publishing it back into the structured namespace. Someone said, well, then once you upgrade this device, let's say you, you, know, you rip this device out, well, you've got two options. You know, so you rip the device out. You can either publish directly into the line with the new device, or you can publish again into the vanilla namespace, and you know, this same script should pick it up. Or you know, that's the whole point of microservices. It's really, and this could live on the edge too, right? This could live on the edge if you really wanted it to. So you could really, you know, you could sort of have it like here, where the PLC is right here, PLC, edge device. So you could get transformation on the edge. That's really what you want to do. That's where like platforms like Litmus, Libre, Highbyte, they're all, you know, IOHub, they are all creating an edge gateway. They're all creating an edge device. So you can not only do transformation on the edge, but eventually do things like uh, taking models from your enterprise and creating models and then deploying them to the edge to do machine learning on the edge. We won't get into that on this, this uh, we won't get into that in this discussion. What we will talk about is using unified namespace to create products that get better after you buy them. And we're gonna talk about how you would, how you would do that. All right, so we start with the unified namespace. Let me drop in. I wanna drop in my Arduino. See. One second, guys. Gotcha. IoT platform transforms flat to yes, Mark. Uh, IoT platform or your edge gateway platform. Um, it could be a, even a Python script that you're running in Python. You can use an MQTT connector, pull the data in, transform it, publish it back. You wouldn't really want to do that because there's so many platforms like the ones I've mentioned that do that for you and they do it in a Dockerized container kind of scalable way. Wrong, all right, shit, sorry, wrong one. Um, let me just pull it up here on the Arduino board. Save image as. This little device, um, it has Four different sensors on it. Let me let me just see if I can pull it up from the. Uh, so this has a motion sensor. Let me just type it in here. That's what that guy has. What product should we use? Uh, someone in the chat. What do you guys What do you guys manufacture? What's an example of something you think that can't? you know, get smarter or better after you buy it. Um, I want like, you know, like bearings or, you know, we manufacture scaffolding or something. I don't know, like come up with a, uh, give me some suggestions in the chat of products that you, I mean, obviously a Tesla is, a, I'm not gonna use that example because that's pretty obvious how that gets better after you buy it with the software updates and, and the data collection. But what is an example of a product that might be hard to, to get better after you buy it. Conveyor idler. Okay, I have to know what that, I, I think I know what that is, but let me see, conveyor idler. Okay. Let's pull it up here. All right, let's, let's great, great suggestion, Ben. I'm gonna go ahead and use that. Do, do you guys make that? Do you guys make one of those or is that just a, something you use in your manufacturing process or both? Do you guys eat your own dog food? Hold on. Every time I try to save the image, it tries to download it as an HTML type file and it does me no good. I don't know if you guys have that problem too. Um, conveyor idler. Is that like... Um, like one of these? Hold on one second. Is 
please. Does that work, Ben? Perfect. Okay, cool. All right, so this works perfectly. <laughs> you didn't give me one that was too hard. All right, so we're just going to... So uh, Ben makes idlers. Let me just pull it up on the screen here. Ben, we make idlers for moving big pile of dirt so we don't have to use them there. Okay, got it, got it, right. I saw one that was more like a flatbed idler, which looked like something Amazon would use uh, for shipping packages in between different belts. But um, uh, Cheryl said, Richard Cross said, I tend to think of a UNS as an entirely collected data, unstructured root nodes and all. But I see what you're saying. Uh, UNS is contextualized, normalized, and fit for purpose inputs. How do these devices communicate? I don't see an Ethernet. Great. I'll, I'll, I'll answer that right now. All right. So we're going to, but we're going to stick with this example. It's a great example. Um, let me move this down a little bit. Can you believe that this one device has all that on it though? Four different sensors. Each one of these used to cost like a thousand dollars each and you'd have to hardwire it in. And now you can, <laughs> you know, so you've got a, a six axis accelerometer, a full motion sensor from Bosch. Thank you, Bosch. Come on. Okay. There we go. So, and then it's got a magnometer, which I think it tells you like north, south, east, west, like, you know, what's the orientation um, or magnetic field. Then you got a pressure sensor and then you got a four in one gas sensor with AI and integrated high linearity as well as high accuracy, pressure, humidity, and temperature. The, the fourth one is the CO2. It has a CO2 sensor. So we're going to take this and we're going to, uh, we're going to stuff it on this guy, <laughs> right? So we, you might put a little enclosure. This thing's really tiny actually. Let me see if I pull it up here just so you can kind of get a scale reference for scale. Ben, how much do, what, is, what, is, what does a client pay for one of these guys? Like how much does a client pay for, like are these like $200, $100? How much, how much is this device? Yeah, this is my, this is um, an Arduino device. This is the, um, I'll pull up the model here in a second, but. Uh, This is the Arduino Nikola sense me, not, not to be confused with Nikola, like the, the scam auto manufacturer, but uh, it's N-I-C-L-A. It stand, it's, it's like, uh, it stands for something. I could, I could pull, here, let me pull up the spec sheet here. So let me stop sharing this. Let me start sharing this other tab. Yeah, so this was like sixty dollars, sixty euro. Oh, let me close Teams because it's it's taxing my laptop a little bit. Um, so it would communicate via Bluetooth. All right, yeah. So designed to easily analyze motion in the surrounding environment, hence the M and E motion and environment sense me. Um, and then the NICLA stands for it's like their new product line for. Um, I don't know what Nicola stands for, but it, it has Bluetooth 4.2. Um, so you can, this would communicate to Bluetooth uh, to, you could use one of their other gateways, right? Um, so they have a couple of other products in the pro line, uh, mainly like the Portentia H7, which does have an ethernet port. Um, I think it also, they have one that has like Wi-Fi uh, or this, you know, Arduino Nano 33 BLE. I know that one has a Wi-Fi option. Um, so yeah, either Bluetooth to some sort of infrastructure or Arduino, you know, sensor to an Arduino um, gateway essentially, or some other combination of those. Um, but yeah, it's got Bluetooth for Bluetooth 4.2 for connectivity. So we'll take, we'll, we'll just sort of take the network portion for granted a little bit, but the, the main point here is and, and again, it, it depends on where this UNS is, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud, but in one way, shape or form or another, this device will be able to report its data to, uh, the, you know, I mean, it could definitely report it to the Arduino cloud, but it also has, uh, they also have um, libraries. Arduino has an MQTT library. Uh, we were talking about having them develop an MQTT Sparkplug B library. My headphones picked the wrong time today, dang. <laughs> uh, 
good thing is like my my audio didn't die i actually uh i'm charging a backup battery in case this one does die but um anyways all right so this is going to be on this device and it, maybe it's going to sit right there and it's going to communicate wirelessly you know via bluetooth or wan some some other function um you know eventually 5g it's all going to be we're, we're not even going to have to think about this when 5g is uh uh ubiquitous. But essentially, this is going to take all the information from this device, and we're going to transmit it, we're going to publish it into unified namespace. And this is, uh, now remember, oh, look at that, boom. It picked up that I wanted to do an arrow. So now remember, this is a current state in events. So where do we store the history? Uh, I'm glad you asked. Uh, we're going to use a Canary Historian. Now this could be as a standalone. Or this could be a little canary sitting inside of our IoT platform, right? If our UNS is on top of our IoT platform, uh, specifically um, Frameworks does this. They have a 500 tag, a 500 count tag. Oh, yep, thanks. Let me uh, share my screen. Thanks, Richard. And this is not an ad for Frameworks or Canary. Um, this is just the platform I would actually use to do this. Um, Canary really easily connects to Unified Namespace for pub sub, and then it stores your it stores your time series data. And uh, you know, this is not really a good example, but these are like consider these as files, right? Or like uh, snapshots, you know, today, right? Or um, you know, time, like each one of these has a time value, timestamp. Okay. So Canary does the historical data. Now it's going to get interesting here. We haven't even told you uh, what I've told you to do is I've told you to create an IoT platform. I think everyone here knows that they need to do that. But uh, what I what I then told you to do was buy this eighty dollars device and stick it on a device that potentially it you know it's going to increase the cost of that device, but it's going to become now a smart device. And what does that mean? Okay, this device is going to be reporting its health to our infrastructure. Right? This is this is a uh, your infrastructure. Right, this is the manufacturer. And you know, and then here, you know, this is the client, right? Typically, when you ship, when an industry 3.0 manufacturer ships a client a product that's not smart and connected, you have no idea how that product's being used, if it's even being used at all. Um, if it dies, you don't know until they call you. So right away, you can report things like, you know, am I on, right? Power, right? You can tell whether or not this thing is rotating, probably just from the IMU, whether it's shaking or not. Uh, that's where the AI platform comes in, uh, right? It's using all that raw sensor data, transforming it on the edge with uh, the processor that it has, and then just reporting the changes or just reporting the meaningful information. Um, you know, vi things like vibration, Uh, utilization. If you ship, uh, Ben, let me let me ask you this: If you ship the customer, if you ship the customer one of these devices, and one customer uses this thing one hour a day, and another customer is using it twenty four by seven, what are some of the things that you would be able to know right away just just from that information alone? Customer A uses this thing ten percent of the day. Customer B is using this in a nonstop 24 by seven environment. And you didn't know that until you put that device on there. What are some of the insights that you might be able to gain from that? Uh, let, me, let me phrase it better. From that information, taking that data, turning it into information, utilization, what are some of the decisions that you might make um, if you're the sales staff? Which customer do you think you you'd probably want to call, which one do you think has a higher need for your product? Um, which one, you know, which one's probably going to break first, <laughs> right? 
Um, so the whole point of this, the whole point of this automatic mean time to be between failure, right? Predict, pre you have a uh, preventative maintenance. I'll do a quick, uh, let's talk about maintenance real quick. Actually, I'm stealing this from uh, real pars the other day. Uh, they did a short, but, uh, we'll talk about maintenance. Can you guys see that? So there's three types of maintenance, right? So you've got essentially, um, this is time or, you know, use. Um, and then this is a uh, lifespan. So how much life does the product have? 100% when you ship it, 0% uh, when you, you know, scrap it somewhere in this range, you know, this, this 10, you know, is a failure point. We'll call it a, uh, when there's 10% left, it fails. This is what a typical maintenance life schedule will look like. Okay. Now, when you get to here is where your failure point is, right? Now, what do most manufacturers do? What do most manufacturers do? Do they, actually, this is a legitimate question. Are, are, are most manufacturers doing reactive maintenance or are they doing preventative maintenance? Because reactive maintenance is you fix it when it dies there. That's reactive. Now there's actually a benefit. Well, the biggest drawback of reactive maintenance is you have downtime, right? You don't want that, especially if this line is, you know, costing you thousands of dollars an hour, tens of thousands of dollars an hour, tens of thousands of dollars a minute. So you do not want to do reactive maintenance, especially when this is not a very expensive part, but it's, it's, it could be holding up a very expensive production line. So then you've got uh, preventative maintenance. Okay, after 100 hours, or, what, or let's call it a, you know, 1,000 hours, we're going to replace it or we're going to maintenance it. So you can, uh, that's here, right? This would be preventative maintenance. All right, I'm spelling that wrong, but there's an A in there. Preventative maintenance. What's the benefit of preventative maintenance? Scheduled maintenance. Yes, scheduled maintenance. And this is something that is, you know, if you have a client that's doing reactive maintenance, that's one of the things you can help them get to. Uh, you don't need to go straight to predictive maintenance, which we'll get to in a second, but you could do preventative maintenance. Start, tra start tracking um, total count, lifetime counters, lifetime hours. Um, you know, you'll start, uh, you, you yourself can pull up a plot, a trend on Canary or another data historian. We like Canary. Thank you, Canary, for sponsoring. We, uh, we, human beings can look at that data and already start to begin to tell, hey, if one failed, if one failed at, you know, 1,200 hours and one, one failed at, you know, 1108, one failed at, you know, 1,500, that was an outlier. You get the point, right? Well, you can use this information to start doing um, better aligning your preventative maintenance, but it's still preventative. The next level, once you start collecting all this data, is to use machine learning and artificial intelligence to do predictive maintenance, okay? Predictive maintenance, let me fix this. Let me take my time. And we'll do green for predictive because it's gonna save you the most amount of money. What does Walker say about the Holy Grail? Right, manufacturing holy grail. There's prediction going on. A human being isn't deciding, hey, you know, we should do our maintenance at 1,100 hours because we'll capture 98% of all failures before they happen and eliminate downtime. What about this guy? Why did we replace? Uh, why would we replace something that could go for 1,500 hours at 1,100 just because other ones are failing at 1,100? That's why predictive maintenance matters. It's, it's, it's telling you, hey, you need to replace this because in a couple hours it's gonna fail. 
It's using past patterns to predict future state. You can't do that without a data historian, a process data historian. You can't do that unless you're collecting the information in the first place. You can't do predictive maintenance unless you're losing machine learning and artificial intelligence. You might be able to get close to prediction, right? But again, a human being can't pick up patterns. You know, uh, how would we do predictive maintenance? Let's talk about vibration. You know, if you've got a chart, yeah, I'll just do it real, real quick down here. If you've got a trend and, you know, this is your vibration and it's, you know, sitting down here and then it starts to go like this, right? And then it fails. Here's the failure point, right? A human being's not going to sit there and watch that trend, right? That would be a horrible job, right? Um, and then again, this might be at 1,100 hours. This might be at 1,500 hours. You need to be using machine learning and artificial intelligence to predict future outcomes based on past patterns, could pick up this pattern. Hey, this is we've identified this. We've trained our machine learning model using, uh, you know, all of these different samples, and it's able to tell us with, you know, with high accuracy when to replace. Boom! Predictive maintenance gets the best of both worlds. You reduce downtime, and you get the most usable life. Right, where you know this was cutting it short. This should be like red. This was cut. The lifespan was cut short here. Here we're, we're causing downtime, right? So all this is like, you know, downtime. This is the money spot. This is why it actually matters. Okay. So right away, you can start doing things like predictive maintenance just from being able to stick the sensor on it without, without really having, uh, you don't even really need, you don't even really need to now, there might be some people that disagree, but you don't even really need to make the business case at first. You might go into it saying, hey, we're going to do predictive maintenance, but you might find just by looking at the data yourself or allowing machine learning to analyze it, which again, machine learning can't analyze it until you're collecting it. So you start, build the infrastructure, step one. Step two, put a sensor on your equipment that you ship out the door. And step three, learn, iterate. Hey, we need higher frequency. We need higher frequency data. You know, this Arduino sense me is not cutting it. We need a, we need a, a more precise device to, to be able to predict this with higher accuracy. You won't be able to know that unless you start collecting the data. So this whole point of this presentation is you don't always have to know what you're going into in order to, to justify creating a smart product that gets better after you buy it. Now, and now again, this, this example, This thing itself is probably not going to, you know, it's a piece of hardware, right? Let me, uh, it's, it itself is probably not going to get better, right? I mean, you can't do a hard, I mean, I guess you probably could ship new bearings out and then have them replace the bearings or something like that if you upgraded the bearings. But it's not as easy as like a software update, right? Uh, let, me, let me pull it up here. But the fact that you can call your customer or you could provide a web service that they could subscribe to that data from your unified namespace, they could pull it into theirs. So you could send them the notification, hey, replace bearing. Um, that's a product that gets better after you buy it. It was a feature that they didn't have, they weren't expecting, that you then provide to them because you, you had the insight to spend a little bit of extra money on a little device to be able to make a product that gets better after you buy it. Does, it, does, this present, does this presentation make sense to anyone? Uh, let's take a quick break here. Um, let's go over questions and then uh, we'll wrap it up. I hope I, made, I hope I made sense here. I hope this wasn't um, redundant or... Predictive maintenance shrinks the delta between potential failure and functional failure curve. Annabelle said yes. Benjamin said, you want a PM as close to failure as possible without actual failure. Yes. And, and, you're, and again, because there's variance in when something fails, you're never going to be able to get as close as predictive maintenance. And predictive, you might not even know that it may not even be, it may not even be vibration that it tells you when it's going to fail. It might be temperature. The thing might start just getting hot. <laughs> I mean, imagine the insights that you could learn just from looking at the data. Um, the data is the valuable aspect, not just to be able to make the product better 
But like I said earlier, if you've got a customer that's using this 100% utilization, they're using it as much as they can versus a customer that uses it for a few months and then let's say they stop using it, right? Well, the customer that stops using it, you might call them and be like, hey, and notice you stopped using our product. They'd be like, oh yeah, we went with a different supplier. Oh, well, why did you do that? <laughs> you know, The worst thing would be then to not, and and typically people won't call you. Hey, I'm, I'm not gonna call Ben and say, hey, you know, I went with a different supplier. I'm not using you guys anymore. Ben might just figure it out over time because I stopped calling him. But if you're using data and information, you can know soon enough to where you could potentially catch it or at least learn from it, right? The other example, if you've got a client that's using this way, way more, you might want to call that client and see, hey, what, what are you actually using this for? You know, or uh, what, can, what can you learn based on how your products are being used in the marketplace to help you sell better products, engineer better products, provide better customer service? This is emulating what Tesla is doing, a small cost to add the sensor in your product, but the upside opens up all kinds of possibilities. Yes, and the whole point is, um, you don't actually, you might not actually know. I mean, Tesla knew that, Hey, these cameras are going to help us train our machine learning and AI models, but they probably didn't originally think, Hey, we're going to create generalized AI. But now that they've literally mapped out the whole entire United States, they could, they could have literally the whole entire US roadmap as part of their machine learning model, right? They have the data to do it now. That was a that was a benefit that they received that they probably I mean maybe they maybe I'll give Elon Musk that credit he probably probably knew that but you know I bet most engineers there were probably just thinking hey how can we create a better machine how can we create a better self driving they didn't anticipate hey we could actually create generalized AI and create a Tesla bot you know Richard Shaw, while well, about 10 times more expensive and Opto 22 Groove Rio is also a good choice. Yeah, and you know it all depends on what the product is, right? For a Tesla uh, Opto 22 Groove Rio, I mean, I imagine their sensors probably cost about what that costs, right? Their self-driving chips and stuff. Um, but you know, if you sell a product that's like, let's say uh, $10,000, adding 20%, you know, adding a $2,000 hardware kit, two to $3,000 hardware kit to it, you know, I mean, you might have to come up with some different pricing model, right? You might create some sort of a subscription model, right? Or you might do this to a subset. Of, you might not do this for every device, but you should definitely do it on a subset of them, right? Um, like, a, like sampling, you know, hey, every 10th machine that we, that we do, we're going to put this on so we can, you know, sample our, our population. That's another option. Um, if doing it on every device is cost prohibitive, you know, you can do it every 10th device and, and then use that. But I mean, ideally everything is smart and everything is connected. So, um, can you run through how this would fold into the CMMS into the unified namespace? Okay. Temperature, humidity, revolution, speed, lots of data points that could be analyzed. Great point. Uh, Mark Ritchie said vibration bearings, uh, SCE vibration of bearings to prevent over lubing, which is a major failure point for bearings. Oh, interesting. Did not know that. Hell yeah. <laughs> I started working our smart idler before getting sidetracked on this whole I 4.0 thing. Keep working on it, Ben. We need, this is, this is not just for fun. This is actually to save manufacturing. This is to save and create middle-class jobs by helping manufacturers do more with less, helping them become the Tesla of their industry right before Tesla is the entire industry. We need small and medium sized manufacturers to be strong in the United States because they employ Americans. Um, let's do this. And especially with AI, especially with AI, quick side note, um, <laughs> Elon Musk said that, you know, there's really, there's two outcomes of AI. One is a dystopian future where we become less human. The other is a, is a bright future where humans are more creative, humans become more human, humans become uh, more connected with what makes them human. And we leverage machine learning, artificial intelligence, robots, and technology to do the things that they're best at. And we create, and it sounds silly, but we create uh, robots that, we create artificial intelligence that has empathy. We create artificial intelligence that shares our same common values. 
that just doesn't happen by accident. We have to actually make it the case. So um, CMMS. Let's go to, uh, we'll do it on this one here. What's the MMS do you use, Mark? Let me see if I can. Maximo. Okay. So CMMS would, you know, it'd probably be somewhere in this MES layer. You're between ERP and, and MES. Um, but for purposes of this, let's just draw it right here. So we have our Uh, most CMMSs that I see, they provide a REST endpoint, right? They, they provide a, an HTTP endpoint that you can hit to query, hey, uh, what are all of my machines or what are all, um, you know, what are, uh, what's my maintenance schedule, right? And any type of REST endpoint, um, you know, typically your CMMS would have like its own interface here, right? Uh, this is a UI that sits on top of the CMMS. The same, um, and I don't know about, I think Maximo, I heard Walker talk about it before, but essentially the same UI, the same, the same uh, REST endpoints, the same scripts, the same function method calls that the UI would use to depopulate its screen should be available via web services. Um, this is actually something we talked about in the podcast with Rick Belota uh, and software like, EM, you know, we talked about the EMQ guys, they use the unified namespace. That, that's actually the next level is literally, um, you know, this UI it is, is publishing like the UI inside of EMQX is being visualized from information that lives in the namespace. That's why Walker was so stoked on it because eventually, you know, it should just live in the namespace and in which case, you know, it'd be like a little namespace in here. And then it would be pub sub, you know, like that. So in the same way that you would visualize the, U, the UI that that's your CMMS gives you, you could also, you know, use the rest of your IoT system to UI. Or if it doesn't have uh, the same underlying technology like MQTT in the case of the EMQ broker, does everyone know what I'm saying here? Like the EMQX broker, uses the spark plug namespace to visualize for other clients is the same namespace that it uses to visualize for its own client. Most people client haven't got there yet. What they will typically do if they don't use the UNS, what they'll have is a database, right? They'll have a database here and there's some scripts that essentially query the database and return the results, query the database, return the results. Hey, give me my machines. Uh, then the script, queries the database and gives you the results. So what you would do is, uh, you know, then the web service call might hit the same script that queries the database, gives you the results. You'd put a little piece of software in here that would, you know, interface between the two, essentially. Um, you know, if it were Ignition, you could use the web dev module or you could just use a Python script to, uh, you know, system.http.get URL, comma, any parameters. It would, it would send the request, the web services would hit the internal database of your CMMS, provide the results, and then what you would do is you'd have in your namespace, enterprise um, site, right? So in this case, site might, be, site might be app, right? It doesn't have to be, you know, you might have enterprise plant one, and this is like kind of all your equipment data, this is your edge data, but you might have, you know, enterprise ERP. Let's see if I can, you might have enterprise, 
enterprise CMMS. Have all your CMMS data. Well, hey, I want some of my CMMS data inside of my plant line one data. Okay, great. Using the example we used before, use your script, pull this data out, transform it, publish it back into the line. Right? That's how you would do it. This is the tradition. This is traditionally the fear that purely OT people have when they hear IIoT and resist to it, but nobody is suggesting that. I hope no one except in jest. <laughs> SD cards are notoriously unreliable. Oh, wait. Uh, Maximo. Hey, Walker, do a video. Walker's not here. Sorry. <laughs> uh, my name's Zach. <laughs> uh, hey, Walker, do a video on using a Raspberry Pi 4 to run critical life safety applications for the digital transformation. All right, that's a troll. <laughs> I trust my life with our Raspberry Pi and OS. Um, you know what I would trust? I don't have it. It's over there. Uh, IO Hub. IO Hub, um, which, by the way, I actually have a, a little bit of news on IO Hub. Uh, they're get, um, they, they got started in the hardware business by shipping the IO X1. That's that nice industrial PC. I think it is also white labeled as a different. Someone said, hey, well, uh, why don't I just get the IO X1 without the I with What's the difference between this Edge device, which someone showed where they could buy it, like with just a Linux distro on it? Versus the IO Hub IO X1, what's the difference? Well, the software is the difference. And the guys at EasyVPN realize that, and they're now allowing you to put IO Hub software on your device. They're talking to several hardware companies that we feature all the time. I don't want to name any names yet, but if you guys are a hardware company, think PLCs, think uh, other edge devices that, that you know, they make hardware, they specialize in making hardware talk about running the IO hub on their platform, right? Um, kind of similar to how like the PLC Next is more of a software product than it is a hardware product. Same, same type of concept. IO hub is going to be allowed to be run on any hardware you want. And they're working on a Linux distribution, IO hub OS. So I could get like, let's say the, uh, um, what's that one? The, uh, Advantech Uno, like let's say I had an Advantech Uno, I could put IO Hub OS on my Advantech Unos, and then I can run Docker containers on my IO Hub on the edge. Um, thanks, too. Thanks, Daniel. Smooth transition here, Zach. <laughs> I, I honestly, this went way better than I expected. Uh, I hope that the audio, it, I know it did sound a little more echoey. I know that this $400 mic obviously sounds a lot better than this, but I, I felt like I did think of that. I'm like, hey, if I'm over here, they're not going to be able to hear me because this thing has like a, a pickup radius on it that's like pretty close. So, um, yeah, it went way better than expected. I hope it was uh, useful. I want you guys to make products that get better after you buy them. And I wanted to give you an actual example. So I'm going to actually probably rechange the name of this uh, YouTube stream to make, making products that get better after you buy them. How? <laughs> Um, Zach and Walker, same person, <laughs> prove me wrong. <laughs> uh, <laughs> machine learning and artificial. You know how many Walker sound bites I have in my head? Like all of them. <laughs> if you spent seven figures on your ERP system, you ought to be ashamed. If you're an executive and you spent seven figures on your ERP system, well, apparently nine figures now, like from what Jeff says. If you're an executive and you spent nine figures on your ERP system, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. I mean, you got hoodwinked. <laughs> Anyways, Dan, thank you. All right, guys, uh, thanks so much for joining. Zach Scriven, subscribe to 4.0 Solutions. Make sure to hit that like button. It does help get the content out to more people. Share it on LinkedIn and, and continue to the discussion in the Discord. Uh, we'll see you guys next week. And thanks again, Canary Labs, for sponsoring the month of October. We've got an exciting new sponsor for next month, which we will announce in November. $20 million on SAP for manufacturing. All right, guys. See you guys. Bye.